welcome everybody. Can you hear me nice and clearly, Dakina, Ella? People can hear you. Can hear me nice and clearly. Um, welcome to all of you out there in in virtual land, and thank you for making the time to be with us today. I'm Deb Sabaris, the CEO for the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare. But before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today. I'm on Wurundjeri land. I'm sure you're on beautiful Aboriginal lands across Victoria. I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present, um, elders from other cultures, um, and that this is and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, we have an amazing session, as always, planned for you today, building on the momentum from previous forums. And I really hope that I'm sure, pretty confident that some of you here today have been to some of our other open events. This is our third open forum for just this year. So the team, Dakina, Ella and Mandy, are working very hard to bring this sort of information to you. Um, and we, and we hope that this is a very timely topic for you today. Victoria's child and family services sector has witnessed a significant cultural shift in recent years um, as more and more organisations um, draw on evidence to support their decision making and practice. And we hear this every day. I'm proud to say that the Centre Through Open has been instrumental in this shift. I'm just looking at Sandra saying her camera is off and she's having lunch. That's fine, Sandra. It just, it just distracted me for a moment. Um, the open team has um, assisted hundreds of individuals, teams and organisations to improve their data collection and use to share what is working with others and to contribute to the development of a robust evidence base of what works for children and families. Our open research review alone goes out to over 3000 subscribers. Events like today's forum highlight the value and importance of sharing new knowledge with each other for the benefit of the people that we work for. Today, we'll explore how organisations can use low cost strategies to incorporate evidence into their organisational practice, embedding evidence on a shoestring. Isn't that what we do? I think that's probably one of our character traits. Um, is it, it's an appealing thought in a tough economic environment. We have four panel members who will share their story of their experiences, focusing on what worked for them, why they started this evidence capability building work in their organisations and their takeaway lessons and tips. I'm delighted that OPEN is supporting and partnering with so many sector organisations to share and generate evidence and support a continuous learning culture. And remember that OPEN is you, it's your portal. Uh, OPEN is all about you and it is for you. Uh, Dr. Mandy um, Charman, OPEN's Program Manager, will reflect on some of this during the session. Now, what I'm going to do now is just do a little bit of housekeeping, so I'll get Dakina to go back to that slide, if you wouldn't mind, Dakina. Um, thank you. Uh, so just for a little bit of housekeeping, and it's always good to remind, remind ourselves of this. If you can take this moment to mute yourself, um, and if you're having a lunch, maybe don't have your camera on, um, uh, and the mute button is in the left-hand corner of your screen. Can you also make sure your Zoom name is your own? Um, because as we go through these um, conversations, it's good to know who's here, and we're hoping to have lots of interaction in this session, uh, and that will help. We will keep our cameras on, and we'll love you to do the same if you feel comfortable, um, as it then it builds a much more interacting, interactive session. Um, also turn on chat and put any thoughts and questions into the chat during the session. Our moderators can raise these or feel free to ask your own questions and engage in the conversation. Um, if you have any tech issues, first try leaving the session and rejoining us. This often sorts the issues out. If not, please send a private message to Dakina, who you will see. Dakina will wave right now. Um, uh, send a uh, private message to Dakina at dakina.mitra at cfecfw.asn.au and Dakina will try and help you. She's very good at these things. Now, without further ado, I'll hand over to David Pointner. Now, um, with I've known David for some time, I think almost as long as I've been at the centre. He's currently the General Manager of Business Development and Research uh, Based Models at Anglicare, who's kindly agreed to facilitate the discussion today. David has his, um, has his own outcomes and evidence journey at Anglicare uh, to reflect on and will be interested to hear his reflections today. Uh, David is, um, absolutely passionate about this area and um, shares a lot of his knowledge uh, with the Centre for the benefit of all of you. So over to you, David, and welcome. Thanks, Deb. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us here today. 
So the topic we're going to look at today is strategies to embed evidence into organizational practice, um, getting started on this journey and even um, how to tackle this on a, on a very small shoestring. Um, in no particular order, I want to introduce our esteemed panel. Today we have with us Dave Vickery, who's Head of Research Partnerships for BAPCARE, Sue Ling Quick, Executive Manager, Knowledge Advocacy and Service, Dr. Benjiani Pizzerani, who's a cross-sector researcher advising governments and organizations on research and evaluation strategies, and Dr. Mandy Charman, Project Manager, Outcomes, Practice and Evidence Network. Each of the panelists are going to deliver a short presentation, and then there will be an opportunity for a question and answer session at the end. If we don't get a chance to um, ask, uh, ask all of your questions, don't worry, as the panelists are very happy for you to email them directly after today and they'll follow up individually. So with, um, with that in mind, I'm going to ask Dave to start us off. Dave? Thanks very much, David. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose uh, land we meet today. Uh, I'm meeting you from the uh, country of the Wurundjeri people, and I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. Um, a little bit about BAPCARE's, uh, um, uh, I suppose, uh, initiation into evidence-informed approaches to practice. And if, uh, if we can move to the next slide. Um, BAPCARE probably got into this space about eight years ago. Um, we've always been an uh, evidence-informed organisation, but it was eight years ago when we started uh, really getting into that area um, significantly through the development uh, quality of life outcomes framework. Uh, and that's an outcomes framework that actually now sits across the entire organisation, uh, across all of its uh, uh, domains. Um, but further to that, in 2017, the organisation moved to really further embed evidence-informed, evidence-based programs into its practice. And I suppose initially this was really focused on our family and children's services and mental health and disability services. And that's very much around the, the purchasing and implementation of program, um, agency programs, including our aged care portfolio. Um, we, we, during that time, we purchased and implemented a range of uh, evidence-based programs. Uh, and interestingly, I suppose, for, in some cases, we also uh, sought to actually evidence our own mental health programs. Uh, uh, BAPCARE has a large mental health service in Tasmania, uh, and it's a statewide service, and we're working with Monash to actually develop an evidence base for that program, uh, and that's now been undertaken uh, for the last two and a half years. I think one of the great things for, for us to allow us to get into this space really about developing a new um, evidence culture, I suppose, is really um, the two primary drivers there is our leadership and our culture. I think probably um, it was great that leadership was prepared to actually uh, walk into a, a walk a new path, I suppose, to say, I suppose to say, and actually take some risk and actually um, and actually financially support the, the purchase of new evidence-based programs, but also to a broader um, approach to um, in, instilling a, an evidence-based culture into our organisation. Uh, we're now thinking more bro broadly in terms of application of evidence into practice, and certainly our staff are actually very much becoming uh, evidence-informed about the way they approach their work. Next slide, thanks. Um, I suppose, as I said, over the last three years since 2017, there's been a significant cultural shift in the organisation uh, towards evidence-informed programs, particularly in our leadership and staff. Um, and while I say there's been a significant shift, it, it is uh, li like all large organisations, there's some people, some areas where there's early uptake uh, and there's other areas that um, people uh, are a little bit behind um, others. So we're actually working on making sure that that uptake is universal across the organisation. Um, as part of the agency's approach, I suppose, we looked at ways to broaden our research capability. Um, and we sought formal arrangements with universities, not only to undertake um, independent evaluations of our work, but also to, to build the understanding and capacity of our staff. We believe it's very important that we have independent evaluation on tertiary institutions, but it's just as important to build our internal capacity, particularly in research and evaluation of our own staff. 
Uh, we have quite a small, we had quite a small uh, research unit uh, to EFT for, uh, and then in late uh, 2018, we embedded some of that research cap capability uh, into Monash University and left one EFT internal to actually uh, continue with the work that we're doing or guide the work that we're doing internally. I think the formal partnerships have really driven um, our uptake into a, um, understanding about evidence into practice, particularly through independent evaluations and research. And also those um, organisations have also helped us do uh, program development work. Uh, and they also spent a lot of time training our staff uh, in terms of the understanding of, of, of evidence, understanding of the collection of data, understanding of things like program logic, evaluation, implementation science. So one of the things that we've worked hard on is to make sure that staff have access to that kind of knowledge, which actually informs the work that they're doing um, uh, with the client. Um, as I said before, um, our results today, we, we, we're developing a culture which is beginning to embed evidence across the entire, the entire um, organisation. Um, we are moving in that direction and we're moving quite quickly. I mean, this is partly due to organisational capability developments, but as Deb's mentioned at the start, also a, cha a change in the zeitgeist with there being a much more um, a concerted effort to move towards evidence-based programs in uh, the programs we run and offer for state government through uh, for our clients. Uh, we're working hard also to develop our internal research and evaluation capability. As I said before, it's great to be able to have external partners, but we need to actually develop our research and evaluation capability with our own staff. Uh, and we do that through a range of um, opportunities through professional development and scholarships. Um, but also too, we actually seek staff out who actually have backgrounds uh, in research and evaluation, uh, who are actually able to um, uh, put their hand up and actually be involved in some of the work that we're doing. Uh, and that's been uh, really gratifying across the whole organisation where there's been a range of evaluation and research capability that we didn't even know existed until we started this process. Um, I think one of the key takeaways for us is embedding research is from universities taught us a lot uh, and they've taught our staff a lot. They've helped us to develop an understanding of our own research and evaluation capa capacity internally uh, and also make the most of the data we already collect. BAPCARE, like a lot of organisations, collects a lot of data um, and we don't mine it as effectively and as efficiently as we should. Uh, and certainly our meetings through universities allowed us to get a better sense of what we do have uh, in terms of data. And also more importantly, convey the importance of collection of that data and why we do it to our staff who are actually therefore then able to actually convey that to our clientele. We've, great, we've developed a greater in, uh, understanding of the importance of implementation, and that's through being trial and error. Some of our um, evidence-based programs have worked beautifully and others have actually um, required um, some remedial action. And I think what we have discovered is that having a, a concerted approach in implementation actually reduces uh, any of those uh, risk opportunities where things might go off the rails. Um, I think the other results today through, we actually, three quarters of the way through evidencing our own mental health and family violence programs, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on. Uh, and I suppose the other gratifying piece of all of that is there's that active staff involvement in our evaluation and research, particularly through dissemination of the results. Uh, and through that active staff involvement, we've actually also uh, been able to engage our clients, particularly through um, our lived experience advisory group in um, uh, Tasmania, which is a mental health specific group, who have actually been able to advise us on some of the approaches we take in terms of uh, research, data collection uh, and uh, communication to clientele. So I'll leave it there and, uh, and uh, hand over to, um, to David again. Thanks, Dave. Um, I will now pass over to Sue Lin. Lena, you're there. Sorry, I did that stupid thing again. I forgot to unmute myself. No, that's okay. That's a, a new thing we've all been learning this year. So, um, so Lynn, if you want to take it away. Thank you, David. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands on which we meet. I'm on Wurundjeri land. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, a Centre of Multicultural Youth has since its inception about 30 years ago, it's had a very clear, um, very clear stream of 
of um, research and evaluation. I think the one of the very first projects that I undertook was a research project. That that understanding really drives the, the type of um, programs we design and the evidence that we build to, um, to have better outcomes for communities and young people. Over the years, we have done evaluation um, for individual programs at varying levels. Sometimes we've done it ourselves and most, a lot of the times we've contracted external um, consultants or, or universities to come in and do it um, for us. We understand that can be really costly. Um, it got to a point where um, quite a few, about six, seven years ago, we started looking through the organization and trying to work out how best to do this for ourselves and to build our capability. The driving, the driver for us was very much with our board. Um, our board decided that, um, probably about five years ago that they really wanted to understand the outcomes that we have as an organization through our strategic plan. So our strategic plan that we've got is a three year by three year by three year plan. And we couldn't quite, and I'm being quite honest and open here, we couldn't quite articulate well um, or to pinpoint well the outcomes as an organization, not just the individual programs. We've got about 40 programs and services across um, the organization. We could speak quite well to a, to a large number of outcomes for all the programs, but we couldn't quite um, speak to the outcomes as one single organization. So about a couple of years ago, we started on this journey where from the board down through our CEO and our executive team, we looked at what's the best way of doing this. We didn't want an external evaluator to come in and, and evaluate the organization. We wanted something that we could own and really be sustainable. So what we did was to um, look at what expertise we had within the organization. And then we went out and looked at um, who could we buy in, in terms of an external consultant to help us develop a framework, a framework and a process that we can take away and do it ourselves. Um, so from there, the organization um, wanted to, and what the consultant that we got, I have to say too, was um, really, was really fantastic. Um, she was very clear about um, being able to offer us the right type of expertise, but also helping us to build cap internal capability. So part of the process in developing the framework was also a plan for how we train up our staff capability. We've got quite a diverse range of staff. We've got about 140 odd staff members. Um, and there's varying degrees of understanding of evaluation and research and varying levels of confidence. Um, what we found too was that some people were um, actually had the knowledge, but didn't feel confident enough to actually do the doing. So part of this training plan is to pull together uh, one, one organizational strategy where we train up everyone around um, evaluation and research processes. What we did too was to pull together an internal evaluation team to look at our, how we actually implement the, um, the evaluation for our strategic plan. And so what we've got now is a really strong core team within the organization guided by the evaluation framework that the consultant did for us. And they are now implementing the um, evaluation throughout the organization. And we've got really good champions across the board in identifying where our weaknesses are in our expertise and our skills and in our confidence, but also where our strengths are. And what, one of the things we discovered was that people had evaluation expertise through previous lives or previous jobs that they had, um, which they, they weren't using in the organization because of the job that they have now. So we could harness in identifying, assessing and identifying um, the capability, we, we were able to pull together a really strong group of um, a team, an internal team to help drive that. One of the things I think what we also discovered along this journey was um, trying to get a culture of um, 
evaluation throughout the organization. As I said, there were varying degrees of um, understanding of evaluation. And I think when you talk about evaluation, one of the things, not just in the organization that I work for, but I think externally as well, people hear the word evaluation and get a bit anxious or a bit scared, thinking it's going to be really difficult and it's going to be um, too hard and it's um, and it requires really different types of skills and expertise that organizations may not have. And I think part of going along this journey was realizing that it's actually not that scary and it's possible to do it if you bring in the right partners and the right supporters around yourselves as an organization. Part of the challenge too in, in doing this as well is also trying to get consistent understanding of what is evaluation and consistent language around how we talk about evidence, how we talk about indicators, how we talk about data, basically, and, um, and getting some consistent understanding across the organization in what we mean by indicators, what we mean by project logics, what we mean by data and how we collect data. So look, it's a, it's a journey that's that was still going on. And I think it's evolving and continuous learning journey for us. And it's also a journey that I think it's well supported by um, our, what I call our critical friends ex that's external to the organization. So a consultant, for example, who helped us to develop a framework, we have gotten her back to do um, one-off sessions with us when, in places where we've gotten stuck with understanding the data. And she's come back in to give us really good, strong advice but also has pointed us to other sources and other people that we can go to, to, um, to get more information or to get, um, or basically being, being a sounding board. So our partnerships with a number of universities in this instance as well, has also helped us to understand better how we do things. Um, the next stage for us in this journey is to, um, really under, we are at a point where we are pulling together all the data across the 35 programs and to have a, a better understanding of the data so that we can then communicate it to communities, families and young people. And in a way, again, switching the language around, how do we communicate what we've found in a language that is user-friendly when we um, bring it back up to communities because I think sometimes going back again to what I said earlier on about languaging, sometimes the language of evaluation can be quite alienating it's, and it's some of the feedback that young people have given us. How do we then talk about evaluation, not just within the organization, but talk about evaluation with the communities that we work with. And, and that's critical for us because we want evaluation that is done with um, communities and not to communities. So for us, the language and, and how we, how we um, bring people along with us on the journey is a critical one. I'll leave that for now and maybe hand it back to um, David. Thanks, Sulin. That's uh, really exciting. Okay, I'll pass over to our third speaker, Benjani. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I would also like to first uh, acknowledge that uh, this forum and all our work takes place um, through the lands of the Aboriginal nations within Victoria and pay my respects to elders past, present uh, and emerging. Um, it's so encouraging to see so many people here today and, and quite a few familiar faces. I think we're in a rather critical time um, with you know, increasing and growing pressures on the sector. But I think that's um, been met with a real appetite for some change and reform and some uh, more nuanced thinking around how to embed evidence in an organisation. So um, I thought what I would do is actually share a more anecdotal um, journey. Next slide, please. Um, a more anecdotal journey around the... Uh, <clears throat> Um, changes and shifts in my thinking from probably a sole academic to what I would now call a, a sector or industry-based researcher. Um, my background is in developmental and social psychology um, with a real heavy and maybe most would think boring sort of psychometric and uh, methods sort of couching or framing. Um, 
throughout that, uh, that sort of academic journey, I've done quite a few postdocs in the US, again, focusing on child development and the legacy of, of trauma in early life. I've been lucky enough to work with some amazing researchers um, at places like the Monash Centre for Health Research and Implementation, School of Social Work, and, and you know, within the School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine. And throughout that time, um, was lucky enough to be able to be embedded uh, within particular evaluations and research that was being conducted at different organisations, including BAPCARE with both Dave and also uh, Anglicare with, with David. It's during that time that I started to really appreciate uh, the importance of not only embedding uh, evidence, but also coming back to some of the things that Sue Lin just mentioned about how alienating this stuff can actually be. And starting to think a little more around pragmatic evaluations, pragmatic uh, evidence. And so during, um, gosh, those nearly 10 years now in academia, there were a couple of, um, I suppose, factors that sort of really drove um, me to think more about how we can do this stuff on uh, shoestring, how we can do it every day, and how we can do it without always the need for external consultants or, or lots and lots of money. So a couple of those you can see on the slide here is a real discomfort with the um, well-documented disconnection between uh, academia and practice, and we know that occurs for a multitude of reasons, different priorities, different funding mechanisms, etc. Um, you know, some frustration around whether my scholarly endeavours were really making a difference on the ground um, and linked to that, this idea of dis uh, dissemination despair and whether we were really communicating what we do in that academic space well with practice and whether practice and, and academia were, were really talking to each other in terms of, um, you know, how to conduct evaluations and the different priorities and goals um, that each uh, sector starts to focus on or wants to focus on. There was a real want for me to conduct that real time testing and rapid sort of evaluation work to guide service delivery as opposed to those more traditional academic models where often you've got to wait so long to understand or even see whether that evidence is ready. And we know that that does not usually come at, um, uh, it does not usually come cheap. And so again, it was that need to not just produce that standalone uh, product, but something that I felt was more embedded and was developing the capacity of the organizations. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. So, um, just wait for that next slide to tick over. Thank you. So many of the um, social welfare problems that you know, I think we face today require some form of, of research-based knowledge acted on um, though by social welfare providers, practitioners, and obviously together with, with governmental organizations. And there are a number of uh, interacting factors and, and competing agendas as to why that can be really difficult. And I think this uh, graphic sort of sums up certainly my experience in the last four or five years working with both department and organizations around sometimes how this stuff can actually feel. You know, you have a program, you have some outcomes in mind, but really actually understanding how to show some impact can be really quite difficult. And again, I think coming back to what both Sue Lynn and Dave um, have chatted about today is that difficulty in actually, you know, knowing how, how to do that. And again, there's, there's a number of factors as to why that might be difficult. Limited timing and resources, um, insufficient funding, that lack of timely feedback on, on things like EBMs. And so with a drive, I think to better connect evidence with practice and maybe close, you know, what we call that knowledge to translation or knowledge to action gap, not being afraid of um, mixing things up. I think you can align decision making with a really um, pragmatic evaluation approach. Um, I think one thing around when we talk about embedding evidence, regardless of the resources, whether they're low, high, whether the organization is big or small, a shift from that narrow thinking around having to prove that something works and then starting to focus your lines of inquiry and maybe you know where this miracle occurs is more about what is the impact or the influence on children and families or the young people or, or, or the other um, populations that you work with and, and what are the associations between implementation quality and how you deliver the program and those outcomes. So starting to shift a little more from just programmatic sort of thinking to much more systemically and thinking about how that program and what you're doing as an organization sits and is embedded within that broader system and context. Uh, next slide, please. In terms um, of progress so far, again, I wanted to um, chat more so about some things that I've witnessed or been a part of as opposed to anything more specific um, because I represent um, not just one organisation but work across you know, a broad range of orgs and feel so privileged and lucky to do. 
So if I could make a real quick side note is that I, I've learned more in the last couple of years being embedded within those orgs than I have in the years and years of um, stats and methods training. It's, uh, it's amazing the capacity of the staff uh, at these orgs. It, it really is. But I think understanding how to conduct and present meaningful research um, and so making sure that that research that you do and embedding that and, and which goes to embedding this evidence is really that it aligns with both organization and those industry priorities. So developing evaluation and improvement processes that complement both data collection for the evidence and for the research itself, but then that are still informing service delivery. These aren't, these don't need to be dichotomous. They aren't distinct. We can do both at the same time. I think, um, Embedding research in that genuine partnership model, this is something that um, Dave spoke about at the top of the session, has, has been one really fantastic approach where you work closely um, with a team of either practitioners and those that are delivering um, a particular program to support that systematic data collection. But I think the most important thing there, and again, David really highlight, uh, Dave really highlighted this, was that building that team capabilities and capacities. It's so, so important and can go so far for embedding uh, evidence in, into your um, organization. Um, you know, continuous improvement um, in practice is, you know, a key goal of most NGOs and ACOs. And, and I think this, that staff is enhanced by incorporating, you know, simple evaluation techniques routinely into daily work. And so that's why that point around any evaluation beats no evaluation. This is what I'm really starting to see a much a, a much bigger shift and much more com being much more comfortable around understanding that you know it doesn't have to be um, a, a, a randomised controlled trial with some step wedge design. It can actually be something rather quite simple. Can give you some really valuable information. I think one thing that we're starting to see, see in terms of progress is a real appreciation for that it's not a linear process. I think as humans, we like to see a straight line to a particular outcome or a particular pathway. Um, certainly, um, my experience in the space is that it, it never will be. And, and in fact, if you, you set yourself up for failure, if you think it's going to be. And so I think in, in, you know, in line with that is um, not being afraid of what you might find, um, being open minded to what the data and the findings are telling you and being prepared to explore some of those areas in more detail. Um, I think not only does that help to shift the culture around research and, and organizations, but you empower staff and um, in doing so, gain multiple perspectives and analysis and thinking. Um, and so it really comes back to that sharing and communication strategies when embedding evidence. So for me, they're the sort of the shifts I've started to see um, in the sector more broadly. Um, and I really do think we're at the, you know, right before the curve of the wave um, uh, in terms of this stuff being embedded, um, you know, thoroughly and, and done in a way that, that's done internally and not requiring consultants all the time um, or, you know, big expensive evaluations. They have their place, but there's so much more you can do. Uh, thank you. I'll hand back over to David. Thanks, Ben Gianni. Um, so last but not least, I will pass over to Mandy. Mandy, you need to take yourself off mute. There you go. I feel for that trap too. <laughs> um, the synergies across what we're all saying are so powerful because we're all sitting in slightly different places. Uh, of course, first, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, which we're all sitting on. For me, it's the Wurundjeri people and elders past, present and emerging. Um, thanks for making it today. Um, I'm already learning lots and writing my own notes down. My name is Mandy Charman. I'm the Outcomes Practice and Evidence Network Manager within the centre. So we've sort of convened this group to try and share and build some discussions and conversations about some of this sort of challenging areas of work. Um, I wanted to talk just firstly, you're probably quite aware of OPEN. It's sort of interesting because um, we have people on our panel with different perspectives and coming from different angles. OPEN is actually looking at embedding evidence, supporting sector to embed evidence in practice at a systems level. So across the whole realm of different types of organizations. Um, in many ways, the same types of strategies work for a system as they do for an organization. So what I'm gonna say isn't going to be all that much different from what um, sorry, I'm just moving this around, sorry. Um, all that much different from what um, our, our other sector panelists have said, but we tend to work across the whole spectrum of different types of organizations. Um, 
we, we focus, OPEN has a, a purpose to focus on supporting the embedding of evidence, its use and generation across the child and family service sector. Um, it was created, and you're probably aware of this, through a partnership between DFFH and the centre. And it's been purpose built to support the sector's evidence journey. So we're sort of really privileged because we get to see and learn and share what everyone is currently doing, which is really exciting. Our approach is at the system level, use similar strategies to those described at the organizational levels. We use three strategies aimed at building shared knowledge and opportunities for the sector to access information, evidence, tools, support, and each other's expertise. And this is one of the examples of that. So clearly uh, we run events like this one to support cross-sector learning, sharing of knowledge and opportunities for collaboration from the sector. Because of course there is so much evidence and expertise within the sector. And part of supporting a learning culture and an evidence journey is providing opportunities to share that expertise and build on an uh, aggregated knowledge base. And that knowledge base comes from sharing our experience as much as for documenting it in in products or publications. Um, we have an open online portal, improving access to evidence about what works, which includes literature reviews, collated evidences, and those types of things, because the sector is very busy and can't trawl through hundreds of, of evidence-related publications. So our um, purpose is to try and make those more accessible. So if there are areas of need that you need consolidated collation of what's the top evidence about this, that would be something that would be within our sort of um, purpose to help you with. We also provide tools and resources to support evidence creation on the portal. Um, and this is to try and to get, get people started, link you to the copious amounts of resources that are there to support people in evidence sort of work. Um, we're planning to relaunch our um, portal in June. We're releasing a whole heap of new uh, products about precisely this, how to guides, that type of thing. So look out for that one. And we also provide advice and training to help the sector use and build evidence from getting started to working with academic partners and doing that higher end type of evidence. So you can see here, we do the building networks and relationships sharing what already works and supporting capability and skill building and systems building. Uh, can we have the next slide please? When we were asked, well, what's been successful? I mean, while we work across the whole spectrum of wherever you happen to be at the time, and there is a really broad ranging approach as we can see from our panel, um, I've come from a background, a strong background over the last 10 or 15 years, building evidence capability within organisations. And this is my particular passion. So I suppose I just wanted to bring this lens to this little snapshot of our, of our work. Um, we're finding the advice and support of open going great guns, actually. Um, we have huge appetite from a whole heap of people who are interested in building their internal evidence capability. It's hugely exciting and um, a privilege, I suppose, for us to work with so many different people. I mean, I suppose when we were talking about planning for this session, so like, well, what would be the one thing that, that the one value, the one success factor that has, in your experience, had the biggest difference? And this would be my one, my sort of, you know, wheelbarrow that I like to push, um, that, that the key... If you're starting out, a good way to get started is to build your evidence foundations internally. And we've already heard a bit about this already. This can help establish capability and organizational features needed to support strong evidence and its use. Building evidence, and we've heard this already, is a journey which has multiple different players, all responsible for different aspects of building evidence. There's all different types of evidence that are appropriate for all different types of purposes. Um, it's not an event, it's actually a journey. It's actually a process to go through. Treating, teaching at it, treating it as an event that occurs at the end disenfranchises people who are probably better suited to building everyday evidence and information that can be most valuable to inform decisions and to guide improvement. 
The idea is to build, and this is what I've had lots of success over many years doing, to build confidence and engagement using basic tools to support organisations to plan for and collect everyday evidence. This creates the foundations that then enable organisations to get better value out of that higher end research or gold standard evidence that is, provides conclusive proof of effectiveness. We don't have to go to that level for every single activity we do. And sometimes sufficient evidence tells us what we've contributed to achieve this outcome. What can that tell us about how we can improve what we're doing? This sector is brilliant at building practice improvement and reflection and learning into their ongoing systems. Evidence, considering evidence and how to use that is just another lens on that same practice that is so well entrenched in the sector. My experience is that building evidence thinking into the start, middle, end of your program or service or organization even has many advantages to the quality of the program as well as the evidence. These are some of the aspects and usually end up building huge advocates at a whole heap of different levels within the organization. So for a planning and design stage, building agreement and engagement regarding what success looks like so that people are on the same page and they have the same goalposts that they're going for. At implementation stage, establishing and measuring what matters so that we don't waste our time capturing a whole heap of data that really doesn't tell us anything. We get the most out of the data that we do collect because the sector already collects lots and lots of data. How do we harness that to answer questions about learning and effectiveness? Um, throughout, it helps you communicate, share and report your outcomes and learnings, both to funders, of course, <laughs> but also internally for recognising achievement and value and engaging with clients because those outcomes are their outcomes, really. And of course, determine whether and when further evidence rigor is required. It's sort of in keeping with what Benjiani was talking about, where we don't always have to go to the nth degree. We can determine strategically what, what needs further rigor and a formalized approach and what doesn't or when it does and who should do that. And so that then becomes a very strategic focus for what are our limited evidence dollars really. I mean, these, these types of activities can cost a lot of money. So using that money very strategically to maximise benefit to the organisation in terms of what their most urgent knowledge needs are, um, is a really good way to ensure you get the type of evidence you need at the type of time you need it. Harnessing both your staff's resources and knowledge, as well as external expertise. Um, I've found that Having this approach means that there are key components that end up being developed in organisations that create a self-sustaining system that then enable people to grow from that and do the type of journey that Sue Lin, Dave and Benjiani have been talking about. So I just wanted to share that because that's my, my, my biggest takeaway from all of this. We're all evidence creators and we all have the capacity to do this type of work to a degree that answers some really important questions. Thank you, David. Thanks, uh, Mandy, and thank you all panelists. I think that was a very uh, enriching presentation and I think there's quite a few uh, bits in each of your presentations we can all take away. Um, I'd like to certainly echo about open being an amazing opportunity for people to network, particularly uh, those individuals. It's a great opportunity to collaborate too. And I think if we're talking about doing things on a shoestring, it's, it's opportunities like Open gives us to be able to come together and look at some of those opportunities. But um, let's move to the more interactive part of uh, this session. And so I'm going to open up the panelists to some great questions. And I thought I would start off by asking you, what do you see as features of a strong evidence culture in an organization? And when we're referring to this thing, evidence culture, what, what do we really mean by this? Benjani, do you want to start us off with answering that? Let me just unmute. I'm extremely conscious of now not uh, not doing that, being the third person already. Uh, look, I think it's it's a great question. I think um, <clears throat> for me, what we mean by evidence culture is probably comes down to um, this idea of embedding and engaging and encouraging 
staff to become active parts of the research process. And coming back to this idea of an everyday uh, monitoring and evaluation is that you need to be engaging all levels of the organization, external and internal needs, I think you need to be considering. But uh, strong evidence uh, culture, I think, yeah, really, if I had to sum it up, would come back down to, to that communication and shared understanding of what's actually happening and how you're, how you're doing it, how the organization um, is going to use that information and data. Um, and, and as I said, engaging all levels of that, uh, of that organization. And again, um, system thinking a little bit as well. Effects on the whole organization, um, I, I think are really important. Thanks, Ben Gianni. Anyone else on the panel like to contribute? I think for us... Yeah, thanks, David. I'll, I'll, I'll build a little bit. Um... Okay, Dave, if you go and then Sue Lynn after. You go, Sue Lynn. No. All right, we'll go Sue Lynn first. Sure. Um, I yeah, think, certainly. I think certainly. Us, I mean, it's just the thing about the site delayed time. I'll tell you what, we'll definitely go with Sue Lynn this time and then Dave. How's that? Oh. Um, I think for us, it comes down to a, a very um, simple word in helping to build the culture within the organization it's, to, it's curiosity. It's curiosity about wanting to know um, what our outcomes are, what our impacts are. Um, curiosity to really want to know, does this make a difference? Um, and from there, working backwards from there, it's yeah, finding the right evidence to be able to answer that question. Um, and I think one of the things that we, through developing this framework, it's really tried what I saw was the the teams really diving deeper, I suppose, in their sense of curiosity about the kind of impacts or the kind of change that is happening in communities and with young people. Thanks, Celine. Dave? Yeah, I'd, 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 like, I'd like to add, I think, to... Both what uh, Ben and then even necessarily, necessarily in leadership positions, but leadership that's demonstrated across the whole organisation at different levels across the organisation. I think sometimes there's a propensity to look for external support uh, to do our uh, work in that evidence space, but we already have a lot of capability and capacity <laughs> internally when we actually reach out to staff and ask. So one of, one of the things that we've done, um, I suppose, is actually ask our operational staff who actually come into contact with a lot of evidence-based programs and, and, what, and what they like to be involved in in terms of some of our projects. And that's led to some real innovative approaches to um, applying evidence to our practice, but also to capturing those staff who are interested and who actually want to continue to make To, to make a contribution in that space. So it actually would not complete. Thanks, Dave. Sorry, we Post. seem to be having a slight bit of technical problems. It's just breaking up a little bit. Um, we'll see how we go on. If not, Post. Dave, we might have to drop the camera at some point. Um, this, that's a great answer, though. Thank you. Um, a couple of really good questions coming in from our audience. Um, one's asking about challenges of establishing evidence culture. And particularly uh, picking up on a point that Su Lim made about consistent language and uh, consistency in evaluation. So Su Lim, do you want to start off sort of talking a little bit more about how you've addressed some of those issues or what's been going on for you there? And then we can ask some of the other panelists about those sort of questions. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Um, we had Prior to the evaluation framework for our strategic plan being developed, we had um, various other tools and resources across the organization um, for evaluation. And one of the things that I was pulling my hair out about was our different understandings and different languages, different tools. So for instance, we had about, I think, five or six different project logic templates across the organization. 
and different understandings of what outcomes and what indicators could be and so forth. So when we, when the board and the leadership is important. So when the board and then our CEO and ourselves as, a, as the executive group decided to take a journey around um, developing a framework for our strategic plan, we, we communicated that well to the organization. So the organization, all the staff knew that we wanted a one CMY in that sense, one organizational approach to how we do evaluation for strategic plan and that will cascade down to program evaluations. Um, we formed that working group and from that working group, we started to unpack where, where the weaknesses in communication were and how do we then communicate back out to the rest of the organization about one standard way of understanding the language and understanding the practice. Um, so that the driver in that one is that, that internal working group, that team of about 10 people who are our champions in that sense. And it's, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not as simple as that. It doesn't happen overnight, but what, what can happen is um, being very clear from the start through that valuation framework, what we mean by the language and really reinforcing that time and time again with all the different teams. So those evaluation champions were critical. They went back into their teams and, and challenged people about how they use different languages, but also gave information about the, the language we were using and why. Why we, and I think it goes back down to that very basic thing again, I keep saying, you know, wh why do we use certain things? Why do we do things in a certain way? And really getting people to come on board with it, but to have that open conversation and open communication. So it's a two way thing. It's not something that it's forced, hopefully, it's not something that's forced into people, but in that two way conversation, getting people to understand why we're doing it the way we're doing it now and why we're choosing to use the language that we're using now. So it's, it's an ongoing process. I think we've come a long way. I think people still have questions around uh, a couple of things, but I think that open communication is the critical one. And that working group, I have to say, it, what's, what's the, the, the really good thing about the working group is that the membership is from our program managers to our youth facilitator who are working with young people on the ground. So there was a good mix of um, experiences of different programs, but also a good mix of different experiences of levels of authority in that sense to understand how we speak about the work we do. Thanks, Sulin. Anybody else on the panel would like to add to that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, uh, just taking um, and building back off uh, Sulin's points, I think this idea of consistency in, in, in language and consistency of thinking is um, really quite an interesting and important one. I think that's probably what starts to actually drive that curiosity is once you start to, to develop some form of a clearer pathway for, for staff, um, you start to create that curiosity or at least generate more curiosity in that space. And what then starts to happen is, some more nuanced and mature conversations around what type of evidence you actually require can then begin. Because, you know, um, thinking from just an evaluation or research perspective is great, but then we need to start to think more deeply around the evidence that you're actually trying to acquire. It may be different for different circumstances. And we know there are particular you know, hierarchies that, you know, people may or may not agree with. There are different forms and multiple sources from which we can develop and build evidence. And so I think as an organization, that consistency and then that communication between and with staff is where you start to be really clear on, this is why we're doing this and this is what we can actually start to find. And then what starts to happen is the evidence doesn't just, it's not, again, just about proving a program works or not. It's about improving daily um, service delivery. And that's sort of the ultimate goal there, I think. And I think, Sue, in your example, really starts to highlight those, those key elements and key examples. So thank you for sharing. Thanks, friend Johnny. Anyone else? Okay, Mandy. As I loved that take, Sue about language, because this is a constant struggle and it's quite um, often highly complex and it makes the resources that are actually out there that could be used to support very hard to use 
because the same term is used, the different term is used for the same thing five different ways. I think um, your interesting point about coming up with a common language and common tools, because I have, it would make it more efficient. I think when everyone in an organisation has to start from scratch, determining what tool to use and how to lay it out and what the process is, it makes it very inefficient. And you can understand people just thinking this is going to take too long because that is one of the barriers for such a big uh, and busy sector. So I think if you can make those time savings by creating greater clarity around how to approach it, that would make it easier for people to embrace these types of ways of thinking. And if I could just add, don't let that be the thing that holds you back. It's okay to just start sometimes as well. You can fine tune those things as you go. Again, not that linear process of one step leads to another, but I think being aware of those things is great. But sometimes it's good just to dive straight in with something. Start something really small, really brief. Um, you don't have to develop huge frameworks all the time either. That's something that takes time. And maybe even Sue Lynn, I think there's a question here that sort of said, how long did that stuff take? You know, um, that can be... That's a journey that takes, you know, sometimes years, in, you know, in the making, so. Yes, the, I thought that was a, a great question. And then you've all, all made some great comments. And I think um, picking up on the idea that, um, you know, we often think of uh, learning cultures focusing very much on does this program work or not work? And I think what we're talking here, what I'm picking up from the panel is this is a far richer um, experience and probably in terms of that time frame. What we're talking there about is a sort of length uh, that it's like a journey rather than a sort of start point and an end point. Um, and probably what we are absolutely convinced is correct today, you will in six months decide is probably incorrect. Um, but I did notice there was a great question on here that we often all struggle with. And I think this is why we often end up with very different languages. It says in here about the battle of trying to align your common language when you're working with specific funders. Um, I think we've all experienced, uh, you know, you need to do 20 different reports for at least 15 different people. So perhaps Dave or Sue Lin, could you, and let's start with Dave, I'm hoping you're still there. Um, could you talk to us a bit about how BAPCARE has navigated that space? Yeah, thanks, David. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, that's sounding a lot better, Dave. Yeah, well, I think it makes it much easier when my head's not uh, in the picture. So, <laughs> um yeah, I think I think from a BAPCARE perspective, you know, we're we're a, uh, an organisation that has multiple different uh, funding streams, and so and all of them seem to have uh, different requirements and, and a different language. Uh, and nothing is probably, I think, a really good example of that is uh, the requirements that the NDIS ask and what the requirements that our mental health services ask. Um, what what we've tried to do is actually have a common language, uh, like uh, Sulina Benjani were talking about, across the whole organisation, and then rather than actually Actually create something separate we've tried to nuance those based on uh, each of the, the the areas or the areas that we're working on so the last thing we want is uh, given that we have uh, a diversity of programs across our organization is a different language so there needs to be a common each of the funders to actually make sure that it's covered off Thanks, Dave. Celine, anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, very much echoing what um, Dave has just said. It's, um, it's a challenge, um, but very much having, um, driving it within us internally within the organisation, being clear about what the language we would like to use and we would like to have and trying to recast it back into our funding agreements or reporting requirements. Um, one of the, one of the um, tricky thing is in terms of evidence is, you know, we all know, we all got different reporting requirements and different ways that the departments want us to report on our programs. It's trying to then, we had to do a bit of a mapping exercise to go, what are, what's the administrative data that we need to give to our funders? Um, what, what is it that we really need to build on top of that to get the evidence that we want in terms of our an organization strategic plan and where can we kind of value add to already to administrative data that we're already giving the department so we're trying we were trying really hard not to add another layer of data collection on top of what programs already have to collect for their funders um, 
and and that's take we're still in that process of doing that so it's taking a little bit of time but i think it's worth doing it so that we don't overburden our staff in collecting um, evaluation data on top of reporting data that they already collect thanks david sulin i think that that's some valuable advice um I thought it was a great earlier question, and I'm going to direct this firstly to Benjani. Um, the question was asked about, do you have to have external <laughs> people involved so that in your kind of culture of learning um, and your embedding of, of, the, of this sort of kind of culture, that you have like a critical friend? Um, and if you don't, how do you ensure that you, as an organization, don't have a sort of an internal bias which says, hey, you know, because we do it, it's great. How, how do you get that challenge going on if that's not one way? Mm. Yeah, look, um, I could probably spend the rest of the session just trying to unpack that, but um, there's a few things in there. First of all, I just wanted to pick back up on a point just made around administrative data and how valuable that can be um, to embedding evidence. You'd be surprised about how much actual evidence is there just in case management administrative uh, data before adding anything else on. So I think that's always the first, first point to look, certainly if we're thinking about embedding uh, evidence on the shoestring. Then David, coming back to this question around, um, you know, a critical friend and then maybe how to do this stuff either without someone external. <clears throat> I think a big part of it is going to be relationships and, and Sulin again mentioned this around having that critical friend. I think looking and using some of the open resources if you're first starting out would be an important process. There's an interesting, you know, there's interesting thoughts around whether an internal evaluation is biased or not. Um, there are ways to overcome quite a lot of that. There are data validation methods you can use where you conduct most of the, the evaluation. You have someone external come out and do a check on that. So they're not part or driving the entire thing, but they're at least giving some objectivity. I think um, another, another part of this is um, starting with those sort of partnership and, and, and academic sort of partnership models, or at least um, looking at how you can embed a researcher to build that capacity. I think if you can start to think about building staff capacity, then all of a sudden that everyday evaluation and monitoring becomes really quite useful and is going to be really strong in terms of delivering, um, in terms of service delivery. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, embedding evidence and David, uh, you know, using a, a metaphor that um, I've heard you say before about testing a, you know, a car's engine, if I can steal it, I think is probably a nice one for, for here is that when we think about embedding evidence, I think really what it has to come down to, <clears throat> um, you, know, you know, oh, sorry, did I just cut out there? I just, my screen just blinked. Can everyone hear me? Sorry. Um, you know, you know, when you're designing and building a new car engine, for example, throughout that process, um, all the parts are subjected to some form of testing. You're looking for how well they work, improvements that could make them better. And so that final engine runs smoothly. To me, that embedding evidence is exactly that approach. And that can be done without someone external. You can certainly lean on them when you need to. But I think that sort of process of testing and refining as you go should actually be internal and not external. The external comes when you're needing to, to go beyond those internal and everyday evaluations. And there are times when that has to occur. We know for funding and et cetera, we need to be showing uh, that's the case. But if you've already got that stuff set up internally, man, oh man, those, those things become a lot easier. Thanks, Ben. Johnny, Mandy, would you like to add anything? <laughs> yes. Um, I do think that, I mean, that that is a risk. I suppose when you think about what you want the evidence for and what is sufficient robustness for your purpose, you can actually capture very meaningful data that indicates uh, causal connections um, and explore alternate explanations for that. Now, this is very common in government agencies as well, even at a Commonwealth level, where there is a consideration, multiple methods um, verifying uh, conclusions and findings, um, and then an examination of what other causal factors might attribute, you might affect or have had an influence on the outcome. Now, for for a lot of the types of decisions we make, that would give sufficient surety to guide the types of improvements of the car engine 
that would end up with a good outcome. Um, the, the confirmation that the car engine works um, at the end requires all of that preliminary work about each of the components as you go through. So I suppose to ensure that we distribute our effort across each of those stages before we actually go to the final test of can we prove conclusively that these caught in a scientific paradigm that these types of causal effects will um, hold true in any context or in any environment. Um, when we're in uh, human services, where our cohorts are much smaller, where it is very, very difficult to control for, um, uh, control for variables in a way you would in an experimental sort of space, then perhaps we save those type of methods for types of questions and at a time in the development of a program that warrants that type of scrutiny. But in the meantime, there are lots of things we can do um, to get very good value out of our effort and our dollars that still can have layers of robustness. I mean, even um, partnerships with academics or consultants to provide independent review. So independent oversight over the process rather than actually doing it for us can be really, really helpful. Um, qualitative data, um, this sector, um, qualitative data is really important and particularly given our, our desire to engage the client voice in these types of processes and Sue Lin highlighted that as well. Um, qualitative data can itself be created in a robust way and I'm actually a qualitative, uh, um, a qualitative researcher myself and have used it very persuasively to make a whole heap of different types of cases but somehow um, often the methodologies that we sort of get pushed towards um, dis discourage or don't see that as important enough. And I think that does a disservice to both practice experience and the client voice as well. So I'd love to explore or if the other panel mem members have any comment about the use of qualitative evidence to support their um, learning and understanding of the difference they've made. Sounds like another panel, Mandy, that we could easily set up. And I think that's a great topic for another one. But I'm going to challenge you all to a tough question that I think is very much about today. And hopefully you can all come up with some great suggestions so that everybody can leave here and look amazingly good when they go back to their organisations and save the money. Is having a large budget absolutely necessary to build a culture of uh, a, a, an evidence culture? And if it isn't, what low cost budget ideas could you pass on to everybody? Just a simple question. Who'd like to start with that easy one? Okay, I will know. Dave, come on, give me an idea. These people are waiting to hear what's the sort of way we can save some money on doing this embedding culture. So to answer, <clears throat> to answer your question, David, I don't think you know, you'd need to have a massive budget to actually be able to undertake this work. I mean, I think Su Lin, Binjiani and Mandy have actually pointed to a lot of resources that are actually out there that help um, organisations considering uh, this move. And certainly um, the material and the resources that open would be a great place to start. But also, too, as I've talked about earlier on, look internally. You probably have resources internally within your staff group that you probably don't even recognise or know about until you go out and ask. And that's certainly been... Uh, one of our experiences with our, our mental health program is that we didn't realise that um, there was a, a large number of staff with um, research and evaluation experience until we actually asked that. So there's obviously internal capacity that you can draw upon. There's the external um, uh, services that, that, such as offered by Open. Um, but more importantly too, there's colleagues in the sector who can provide advice too. I think sometimes we become quite siloed off in terms of uh, our work and there's an opportunity to work across the sector uh, with other colleagues who can actually support the work that we're doing as well. Uh, all of that doesn't uh, cost anything uh, other than time. And I think that actually ends up being a, a really good approach to start with. I think um, then contracting researchers in as an expensive uh, part of the business, as, as Sue Lin and Benjiani have said, but I think you can do a whole lot of that work and maybe bring those people in towards the end of it uh, when you want to actually um, collect uh, specific types of data or you want to validate the data you've collected. Great. Thanks, Dave. And I think everyone's relieved to hear we don't need a large budget because we all know we never have one. Um, Sue Lin, other tips and hints you want to pass on? 
Yeah, very much in agreement with Dave. It's looking around to see who could um, provide you with the support. Um, what we also, I think it's also partly being bullshit. So what we did was also just basically went knocking on university's doors. So like for instance, with Melbourne Uni Youth Research Center, you know, we went to them with particular issues and said, can you help us? And they said, yep, happy to help. Um, and leaned on um, the expertise and expertise of other consultants that we've had in the past. Um, and also other um, colleagues in the sector. So very much, I, I think this sometimes what I'm a bit puzzled about is um, people seem to think that um, the sector doesn't have the expertise or the sector don't have a lot of expertise. And I think the more, the more you dig around, I think there's a collective, um, there's a collective knowledge in the sector that if we all put our heads together, we, we can find people or groups of people who can help us with particular problems. We may not have someone who can help us from the start and all the way to the end, but I think there are people out there. And, and like Mandy is saying, you know, if the starting point is the portal and using yourself, Mandy, as, as resource people to give you um, ideas or contact details of other people in the sector, um, that for us has been really helpful. It's the snowball effect of who, who knows what and where do we go to. I couldn't um, uh, reiterate that enough, actually, and particularly getting information from all of you about where your biggest areas of needs are, because we have developed a whole heap of resources. But of course, this is a really broad church. That's what I like to think of it. It's a hugely broad church, and it would be really wonderful to know where, what type of information, resources, how to guides would make would, would meet those immediate needs. I suppose I'd just like to one, add one other thing. In my experience, often giving a person, um, I've been in a number of roles where I've been the evaluation coordinator for the organization. And that meant I didn't do any evaluations. My role was building systems, policies, and capability building processes. And in one particular role, I was one person, the only person tasked with doing this in an organization that had about 2000 people. Um, and because I had that responsibility, I was the only, I was the one that had the capacity and the time to reach out across the organization. And I ended up building evaluate, we call them evaluation champions. And all of them had prior evaluation experience, but weren't in evaluation or evidence or research roles currently at all. But they all had really great technical skills that then they lent across the organization um, to support their area and other areas activities in this this way so in actual fact i negotiated them to be released one day a week or something to do some of this work in their organization which meant my one person came about 10 people in inadvertently um, because of that just that opportunity to leverage people's enthusiasm so i couldn't underestimate you can't underestimate the value of having someone who has that responsibility i suppose Thanks, Mandy. Benjani, with the question I often put to you is that I say I want a huge, massive piece of work done and I have absolutely no money. What are the sort of tips you could pass on? Yeah, I think in answering that, I could probably go back to just some of the things that were just being spoken about then. For me, the answer is, yeah, no, you don't need um, a big budget. I would say, one, beware of false profits. If someone's asking for huge amounts of money, and they're doing an evaluation over three, four years, and there's no real attempt to develop capacity, I think um, I would move away pretty quickly. And unfortunately, that occurs. I've been a part of programs where that, that's, that's actually been the, the case. And there's different reasons why there is a perception that you need big budgets for, for research. And if I could just you know digress on those uh, maybe just a little bit, I think the first one, again, is that traditionally it's that you need to do something really hardcore and really high level. That's always the thought when we think about doing research, just these RCTs or whatever, or randomized control trials or whatever it might be. When again, embedding evidence is so much broader than that, as we've spoken about, you don't need a big budget to start to think <clears throat> really quite um, uh, systematically about, you know, your program and your outcomes that you're interested in. Um, I think, um, again, as well, you know, just, just, just going back to what both Dave and, and Sue Lynn had mentioned is that there's 
still a, a bit of a perception that there's not enough expertise already in the sector, which which just blows my mind that working in it for the last four or five years, there are really amazing people doing really amazing work. Um, and I think it's it's trying to find those people and work with those people. And Dave said it, you know, look, I mean, I know there's the, silo, the, the, the silos, I don't know if we're ever going to smash or break them down, but I think we can connect them. And by doing that, I think we start to really start to find um, this type of embedding evidence doesn't have to doesn't have to cost a lot at all. Um, if you are at, at a point in your organisation where you're able to embed a researcher, but it's to drive capacity building, then in a sense that's where you start. May have to upfront spend a little more, but you know down the track what you start to get is I think a really really uh, really good bang for buck or, or you know return on investment. So. Um, I think there are ways it can be expensive at times, but again, just be making sure that uh, it's for the right reasons that you're spending those sort of dollars. Thanks everyone. I think there's some great tips in there. I would probably add one little tip that I would put out is that, you know, the families or the people you're working with, um, you know, that's a great resource to help you embed a, a kind of learning culture that we often don't think about as a great resource that's sitting in front of us and, you know, certainly what we, I would say is that people really often welcome the opportunity to be part of something, but we often put them as a focus group or whatever. But rather than you start to think about them as a sort of end-to-end -end, uh, experience, uh, the people who experience your services, I think they could be a, a great addition. So I heard in that quite a few times people talking about using staff and drawing on staff. Um, how have you made staff at the heart of this kind of learning culture so Lynn, I, I know you've got some great ways your organization is working with us. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you've done that? Um, I think it's starting with um, a really strong commitment, I think from our CEO to start with, to say, this is a journey we want to go on. And it's a journey that it's not, um, I think like I think a couple of years said before, it's not a linear journey in that sense. It's a learning journey for us. So there will be times when we when we have to take two steps forward and a step back, and that's fine, but this is a journey we need to go on. I think it's also about um, finding the groups or the individuals in the organization who have that evaluation curiosity to start with. And then from there, you start building, like many had said, uh, evaluation champions. So they are the ones who, who have that lunchroom conversation, that coffee conversation. It's not just in formal team meetings or in organizational meetings. It's that everyday conversation that we need to have and going, you know, oh, what does your program do? What, how, how, how do you think about the outcomes? Or how do you think about what's the impact you're having? with families and communities. And it's, you're so right, David, it's also talking to, commu to community families and young people about, has this made a change for you? What does it mean for you and for your families? And trying to have that everyday conversation, I'll call it. It's not just a formal conversation about, this is an evaluation, this is the technique, this is the, the skills that we all need to have. It's how we build that curiosity from the start and there from there, what we started to uncover was areas of interest that people had and people wanted to go, um, people needing to, wanted to, and said, we need something more. We need a training session or we need a, a information session on what does outcome mean? <laughs> what does outcome mean for us as an organization? Um, so the curiosity drove the, the languaging of the framework um, and from there people went oh, I don't like the term you know and, and, and rightly so some some staff members say it's not the hard data it's the it's the um, it's what people tell us it's a what we call the qualitative data how, how do we capture that how and Mandy you're absolutely right we could have a whole session on what is qualitative data as opposed to hard data and is one better than the other I would say no I would say we need a mix of them and so it's that driving that that deeper curious question and getting people to go actually I think we do have the evidence of what we call evidence 
what they would call just feedback or conversations that they had with clients or, or with families or communities. How do we harness that to make it um, valid? And, and, and then it led to other questions. So I think for me, the main thing for me is, is getting the leadership and, and our, for our CEO to really help us ask the curious question. Thanks, Lynn. Right, we're down to just the last few minutes. Gosh, that has gone really, really quickly. Amongst our panelists, is there any concluding thoughts or any little pearls of wisdom you'd like to just part with us in this last couple of minutes quickly? I'll start with Dave. Dave, do you want to sort of pass on any last thoughts? Yeah, I think probably as as Benjiani and Mandy and Sir Lynn have said, you know, this this journey is evolutionary. So we'll take you know, two or three steps forward, we might have a step back, but we've got to uh, continue to make the journey because we learn just as much from the things that don't work well as we do from the things that do. Uh, and I think uh, one of the principles of actually embedding evidence is really, as, as Sue Lin's quite eloquently put, is really around that communication. It's about that shared language. It's about um, talking across the whole of the organisation from CEO down to people who are actually doing the work at the coalface. It makes such a massive difference and it actually brings an inquisitive inquisitiveness to the organisation, which really helps uh, put that evidence into practice. Thanks, Dave. So, Lynn, last thoughts? Um, talking, conversations. I think, you know, bring it into your everyday conversations. Um, use other language. Don't, 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 talk, don't use evaluation if that's a, a word that scares people off. But often ask people, you know, what's the impact? What's the impact? What change have you made? What change have we made as an organisation to that family? How, how do you know? So using simple everyday language to bring um, the evidence, drive the evidence back into a central kind of hub for the organization. Right. Thanks, Salim Benjani. Yeah, look, I think <clears throat> some really amazing um, points there from the other panelists, but um, I think I may add that, yeah, no, not, there's no one size fits all. Um, and don't get bogged down in those details. Don't get too concerned with people telling you you need quantitative, you've only got qualitative and vice versa. And vice versa. What you want to see actually is that those information and data and multiple sources converge to tell a similar story or can complement one another. Don't get bogged down in this hierarchy of evidence debates and worrying about whether it's efficacy versus effectiveness. Those are the things that will pull you back. Let the academics debate about, let us do those debating, just get on with it, I think, and, and take a dive. Making a start with something simple, even like what just Sue Lin said, a couple of questions. Ask, who, ask a few practitioners who are delivering a particular program, why they think particular things are happening, why they think there's impacts or change. And then as a group, have a look at the themes that emerge from that those questions. I think you'll be, um, you know, really quite pleasantly surprised that one, you're actually doing research and evaluation, and you're already starting to embed evidence in quite a simple process. Thanks, Benjani. Mandy, I um, second everything else everyone has said. Just get started. Don't get too bogged down in the technical language. Choose the language that speaks to you. What did you do? How well did you do it? And what difference did it make? How, how do you know? They're just basic evaluation questions. If anyone does want to talk about this further offline, out of session, opens here, we're really happy to help anyone who wants to get going and get started. And if nothing else, we could put you in touch with sort of resources that are easy, easier to navigate for getting started or the more sort of sophisticated end of things as well. Um, it's been fascinating and I just... Yeah, the generosity of everyone in sharing their insights is just amazing. It just, oh, just makes you your shivers. Okay, so it just leaves me to really uh, thank our panellists. I think it's been a, a fabulous session. I think we've all got lots we can take away from today. And a big shout out to Open for making this possible for all of us. Um, and, you know, thank you all of you for coming along and participating and making this so interactive because I think that's when the richness of these sessions really, you know, become as they are. So just thank you so much for, for coming along and please enjoy the rest of your day.